The second paper that examined these events took those paralyzed species interactions that were found by Polymeris and Caro, added a few of their own, tossed out all relationships involving domestic species, and more quantitatively examined how body size affects these interactions, how sociality affects these interactions, dietary overlap, and tooth morphology. And what they found is that body size can be a fairly significant driver of these patterns, and they hypothesized that there's a set range of body sizes that you're most likely to see <coughs> these interactions occur in. And they suggested that if you're either twice, anywhere from twice the weight to another, of another carnivore to 5.4 times the weight of another carnivore, you'll be more likely to kill that carnivore than if you weigh less than two times or more than 5.4 times. Less than two because the threat of being killed by that animal is too great if you're too similar in body mass or much smaller than that carnivore in body mass. Alternatively, if you're 5.4 times the body mass or greater, they suggested that the animal is less ecologically relevant to you. You're less likely to be feeding on the same sorts of prey, etc., and therefore you don't gain these ecological benefits of killing carnivore species. They also found that in general, increasing amounts of dietary overlap tends to cause an increase in the frequency of killing relationships, and an increased amount of predatory tooth morphology and habits can cause an increase in the number of killing relationships as well. Because you're better equipped to kill other species, and as part of your active ecological lifestyle, you're used to killing other species as well. Now, this brings me to my own research into these kinds of killing relationships. And through a search of the literature, I really thought to answer several primary questions about what governs these killing relationships between cats and other carnivores. And the first of these, when creating a larger data set with a more intense amount of sampling, I wanted to more precisely understand the degree to which body size influences these killing relationships. Do these constraints that Donario and Buzzkirk had hypothesized about come through when you increase the sampling by a fairly significant Margin. I also wanted to look at how sociality affects these things and whether or not being social can offset body size constraints that keep you from killing a larger carnivore species. Now, another thing that I wanted to examine was uh, whether or not the lack of inclusion of scat and stomach data may have biased our inferences about the preponderance of smaller species. It's well known through dietary studies that smaller carnivore species tend to be underrepresented when you're only examining kills, and vice versa, larger carnivore species tend to be overrepresented in kills. And so I wanted to see whether or not including scat and stomach data would change some of our inferences and our understanding of, the, of who kills who within carnivora. And finally, I wanted to get a better idea of how competition plays into things. Are you only killing your competitor, or is there a lot of cases where you're killing animals that you're not competing with and are instead engaging in active predation? Now, I mentioned within this talk that I focused this research on those species interactions that involve cats, whether it be one cat species killing another, a cat species killing a non-cat carnivore, and a non-cat carnivore killing a cat carnivore. And those are both personal reasons in that I'm most interested in cats as a researcher and logistical reasons to focus these killing relationships to only cats. There are also good ecological reasons for this. And those are that cats exhibit a tremendous range of body sizes, all the way from the 191 kilogram lion to the 1.1 kilogram black-footed cat and rusty spotted cat. And with this large range of body size comes a large range of associated ecology and possible body size constraints with it. <coughs> now, with that said, I dove into the literature, and using Google Scholar, I performed a variety of different Boolean search terms, including things like jaguar and diet, uh, jaguar and food habits, predation, kill by mortality, etc. And I performed these search terms for all the world's terrestrial carnivore species. And having put together a very large data set, I'd come to the conclusion that interspecific killing is absolutely pervasive throughout nature. 
Throughout the course of literature, literature search, I identified 469 distinct references describing these killing interactions. And these references describe 283 different pairwise species interactions. And of these species interactions, 128 were only found in the observed mortality data set, 85 were only found in the dietary data set, and 70 were found in both. And finally, these killing relationships occurred in 862 different countries across the globe. And so this is a global phenomenon. Now, just as increased sampling will tend to reveal new and unusual and unexpected species in biodiversity surveys, so too can an increase in sampling in the literature for interspecific killing events reveal the existence of highly unexpected, strange, and unusual species interactions. Now this is the leopard, and the leopard is a very well-known cat extending all the way from South Africa into Eastern Asia. And as a consequence of this extensive range, the leopard is sympatric with and has been known to be killed by a great number of different carnivore species. These include lions, spotted hyenas, African wild dogs, gulls, tigers, and especially importantly, the domestic cat. Now, I was as surprised as I'm sure you were to see this, but this is an article in the 1956 journal issue of the Journal of Bombay Natural History. And I've highlighted and zoomed into the relevant portion of this article. And it reads, obviously the leopard had attacked the cat whose head was in the leopard's mouth. On closer examination, it was discovered that the cat had bitten through the leopard's windpipe, and there were claw marks through the tongue. Hats off to the cat. <laughs> or, in modern, more modern lingo, Victory cat is victorious. <laughs> now, not all of these strange species interactions are unusual because they defy your expectations of the role that body size should play in structuring these killing events. They can also be unusual because they involve species that no longer coexist today. Now, this is the Asiatic cheetah. And today, the Asiatic cheetah is restricted to a portion of the country of Iran and only exists in a population less than 100 individuals. But in its historic range, the cheetah stretched all the way through different <coughs> portions of India. And throughout this literature search, I found a book that was written by a British hunter and naturalist in the early 1800s. And in 1840, he had documented a tiger attacking and killing a cheetah and leaving its carcass to rot. And this is a species interaction that though it occurred in the past, cannot occur today. And so without this kind of uh, large-scale sampling, it's a species interaction that we may not have been aware of otherwise. So with that said, let's dive into the data. And I relate to this topic uh, quite a bit with uh, this research. Now, a lot of the covariates and a lot of the information for a given carnivore species that I have put together come from a book that was recently released by a biologist by the name of Luke Hunter. And Carnivores of the World is a field guide to all of the world's terrestrial carnivore species. And in it, he gives information on uh, maps, and he gave them uh, in terms of ranges. And so for each of the carnivore species, I took the median value of any body mass range that he had given for that species. He also gave information on sociality, whether or not these are grouping species or whether they tend to be solitary. And finally, he gave information on diet. And using this dietary information, I constructed different broad scale categories that each one of the carnivore species fell within. And these included whether or not they're insectivorous, whether they were uh, frugivorous or piscivorous, fitting on fish, uh, whether they weighed less than one kilogram whether they weighed 1 to 20 kilograms, and whether they weighed um, greater than 20 kilograms. And um, I, I assigned these categories based on the preponderance of given species diet. And in those cases where they uh, fed on multiple categories, I would assign multiple categories to that carnivore. And in cases where it was a little bit more vague, where he mentioned that sometimes a species feeds on a certain food item, I looked through the literature for the carnivore and tried to see whether or not that food item comprised 20% or more of its diet, and what it did.
did, I added that category to his dietary habits. And this gave me a broad scale measure of whether or not competition was occurring. And that if you're found in the same dietary categories, you have the potential for exploitation competition. Now, one of the most important effects, and one that served as a response variable for many of the regression analyses I'm going to describe, uh, was how different the killer species and the killed species were in body size. And I had to come up with an index that would both capture uh, how different they were in body size while being easy to interpret as well. And to do this, I came up with the body mass disparity index. And to calculate the body mass disparity index, which ranges from negative one for a small species killing a much larger species, to one for a large species killing a much smaller species, you have to calculate it in two different ways depending on which end of the index you are on. So in cases where a larger species is killing a small species, like a jaguar killing a white-nosed kawadi, you take the mass of the killer species, you subtract off the mass of the kill, and then you divide by the mass of the killer, or in this case, 97 kilograms of the jaguar minus the 4.55 kilograms of the quadi divided by the 97 kilograms of the jaguar gives you a body mass disparity index of 0.953. But the problem is you can't apply this for all killing relationships because in those cases where a smaller species is killing a larger species, it's no longer binded between zero and one. And so I had to uh, calculate things differently for those cases where a small species kills a large species. Or in this case, uh, tigers, uh, doles killing tigers. And in those instances, you take uh, the negative mass of the killed species, which is the tiger, subtract off the mass of the killer species, which is the dole, and then divide by the mass of the killed species, in this case, negative 0.907. So this index stretches from negative one to one and is really quite readily interpretable highly negative species on this index, those species interactions that have very, very high negative values of the body mass disparity index, imply that a very, very small species is killing something much larger than it. And the converse holds true for high values of this index. Now, the problem with incorporating this index into progression analyses is that it's very difficult to deal with distributions because it's binded between negative one and one. And so to be able to find the distribution that I can apply for the various regression analyses, I performed a transformation on the index by adding one and dividing by two. And this made the index so that it was binded between zero and one, but holding the same distributional shape. So in this case, the untransformed body mass disparity index values range from negative 0.907 and 0.953. Applying the transformation, gives you a new, a scale body mass disparity index of 0.0465, which is very close to zero, in this case implying the smaller species killing a large species. And 0.977, which is on the far end of the scale body mass disparity index, once again showing a large species killing a small species. So this is scaled between zero and one. Now, this is the distribution with both data sets combined. So all the dietary data, all of the observed mortality data put together in a single history. And what I wanted to do was to be able to compare different subsets of this distribution. For example, comparing the body mass disparity index values of those species that are found in the dietary database versus those that are found in the observed mortality database, et cetera. And so to be able to apply models, um, I had to find a distribution that fit the data particularly well. And to do that, I looked at three different statistical distributions. And these were the beta distribution, the Gaussian distribution, and the gamma distribution. And upon applying those distributions to this full data set, I ranked their comparative values by AICC scores to find the distribution that provided the best fit. And the end of the results of that can be found right here. And it basically showed that the beta distribution blew both of the other distributions out of the water. And this isn't particularly surprising in that the beta distribution is, first of all, binded between zero and one, and uh, is continuous, which this, the scale body mass disparity index had both characteristics. 